Welcome, everyone. This is a pretty big audience. Thanks for coming. Uh, we're going to tell you about 10 ways to shoot yourself in the foot with Kubernetes, and uh, hopefully number nine surprises you. Uh, start with a brief introduction. So I'm Rob. I am in charge of the compute team at Datadog. So we run all of the Kubernetes infrastructure there. And I'm Laurent Bernay. I'm staff engineer in the infrastructure organization at Datadog, and I work on Kubernetes too. So first, a little bit about why you care what we have to say. Um, so probably most of you know that Datadog is a monitoring service. So customers send us metrics, traces, logs. Uh, they build dashboards and alerting through our product. And so it's sort of a, you know, positioned as a cloud-native service provider um, where we sell a product to all of you as you're running your Kubernetes. For us, we're running the infrastructure that runs Datadog. And so our perspective is a little bit more that of a cloud-native end user. We're experiencing it all kind of similar to you. And so that's the perspective you're going to see throughout this talk. We've been working on the Kubernetes project for about a year and a half. And we've had production workloads for about a year now. And we're starting to run pretty big clusters. So in production, we now have uh, several thousand nodes managed by Kubernetes. And to give you an idea, our biggest cluster today is about 2,000 nodes. And the typical size cluster would be about 1,000 to 1,500 nodes. And well, as you can imagine, managing clusters this size is not really a walk in the park. And we've had like many outages. And today, we're going to focus on the ones where we actually broke things ourselves and try and share lessons learned so you can avoid making the same mistakes we did. So, um, <laughs> the first time uh, a team complained about DNS, like about a year ago, we figured um, there was a problem with the application, and we kind of dismissed it. Turns out, well, there's a lot of way to break DNS in Kubernetes, and we've faced quite a few ones. And I'm sure that if you run Kubernetes at scale, you've had issues with DNS. So let's start with the first one. So as a quick reminder, the way um, Kubernetes manages DNS usually is the kubelet is going to inject a resolve.conf file, and you're going to see all these search domains there. So the first one is going to be namespace.service.cluster.local, then service.cluster.local, then cluster.local, and then the search domain inherited from the host you're running on. In our case, it's ec2.internal there. And there's also this option that's very important. It's n dot equal 5. And if you're not familiar with it, this is how it's going to work. So imagine you're in a pod, and you want to look for www.google.com. Since this name has less than five dots, and this is what the n dots option is for, it's going to try and add all the search domain to it. So the first queries to the DNS server is actually going to be www.google.com.namespace.service.cluster.local. And of course, the DNS server is going to say, I have no clue what that is. And the resolver is going to go through all this list and finally send the raw query, which is going to actually re resolve to uh, an IP address. This is pretty inefficient because, of course, um, you do five queries for an answer that's pretty simple. And it is very bad on the client side because it's much l slower. And it's also bad on the core DNS server because we use core DNS because you have a lot of queries that are actually useless. There's this pretty interesting feature in core DNS, which is called autopass. And the way it works, if you see the query, the first query to the one that, was, uh, that I was showing earlier, this, when core DNS is getting this query with autopass enabled, is going to strip the namespace.service.cluster.local and try to be clever and find out what was actually meant and trying to find the proper answer. In this case, it's going to answer with a C name for www.google.com and then add the IP address as an A records. So it's much better. And it's a single DNS query instead of five. It's much faster. It's better. So we had high hopes. What happened one day is some teams start complaining that DNS was broken and that DNS query was timing out. And we looked at the core DNS metrics, and we saw that suddenly the amount of self-fail error to upstream was very high. I mean, it's usually zero, and it was pretty high. And we investigated, and it turned out we were rate limited by the upstream. And what had happened is that the number of queries had increased, 
And since we had AutoPass enabled, AutoPass is trying to be clever and always do an upstream resolution to match uh, an upstream query, and it doesn't do any cache. So at one point, we just reached this limit where nothing was working anymore because we couldn't reach the upstream server anymore. And so any resolution outside of the cluster was failing, which was pretty bad, as you can imagine. Well, this one is also about DNS. Um, we've had quite a few. We're only going to share two today. In our cluster, um, we use IPVS um, for load balance services. So we access the core DNS service with IPVS. The way it works is the pod is going to send um, DNS query to the virtual server that is backed by the backend pod, which are the core DNS pods. What's important, and you're going to see next why, is that there's also an IPVS contract that's tracking all the connections managed by IPVS. When you do a rolling update, what's happening is actually when you, the pod is going to be deleted, it's going to be removed from the backend servers, and a new pod is going to be created. In this case, you can see that pod A is gone, and pod D has been added. But if you have a high load of queries, as you can see in the contract down there, the contract from port X to pod A is actually still in there. And if you have a, high, uh, a load that's high enough, port X is going to be reused at one point, and this query is going to be routed to pod A. Since IPVS doesn't have a backend for A anymore, it's going to be dropped by the kernel, which is pretty bad, because the DNS package is just going to be gone. There's actually uh, a tunable you can use in the kernel to make it a lot better. But this tunable is not set by, wasn't set by QProxy at the point, at the time. So it was actually uh, kind of a problem. So we introduced uh, this option in the, in, in the QProxy implementation, but we introduced it ap um, after a graceful termination. So the behavior I described before was how IPVS was working before I, uh, graceful termination was introduced in 1.12 and backport in 1.11. In Graceful termination is trying to be a lot more clever. Instead of removing a backend and black holding traffic when you delete a pod, it's going to say the weight to zero, which means no new connections are going to be sent to pods with weight zero, but established connections are still going to work. This is much better for TCP. However, it's kind of pretty bad for UDP because it's, exactly, it's going to be almost the same behavior as before. If you reuse a pod that's already mapped, you're still going to get routed to a pod that's not there anymore. So it's going to be slightly different. The package is not going to be dropped by the kernel. It's going to be routed to an IP, but this IP is not there anymore, so your DNS query is going to fail. The good thing is uh, QProxy maintainers are well aware of this, and we've been working on it for quite a while. And now we have a good idea of how to fix it, and hopefully we have a PR that's going to make it a lot better in the next few days, I think. Well, I think Laurent will talk about DNS all day if we let him, but um, let's talk about something else. Let's have some diversity. Um, so this is a kind of an interesting one. You know, we really don't like when our users come to us with error reports. We usually like them. We catch them with our monitoring first. But in this case, users came to us, and they said that their jobs weren't starting. Um, and we saw some evidence that it might be related to image pools. So we went to go look at sort of state of all the pods on this cluster. And we see that there's something going on. There's quite a lot of error state pods related to image pools. It's not, real, it's not, re, uh, not affecting running applications, so this is good. But there's certainly something going on. First place we look is at some metrics related to image pools. And we can see that there's an interesting pattern here. Um, sort of drastic increase in the number of image pools that's sustained for a while, and then another drastic increase. So there's certainly something weird. You see this sudden change. And so first place we go is to look at what the actual responses from the image registry are. While they're not good, we're seeing quite a lot of 429s, so indicating we're being rate limited by our, uh, by our image registry. So at this point, we realize that no nodes in this entire region are able to pull from our image registry. So what happened? Well, we created some change on the permissions on a bucket that one of our applications required read access to, and it could no longer start up. And so this daemon set that's running on roughly 1,000 nodes on this cluster starts going into crash loop. But it had a really dangerous feature enabled, image pull policy always. And so every time it's restarting, it's doing another pull of the image that's already existing on the host. And so it's sort of compounded by the fact that we actually have all of our traffic to our image registries going through three NAT instances, one per zone in this region. And so the image registry is looking at this, all this source traffic coming from only those three IPs and seeing it's way, way, way 
unacceptable, and rate limited us. Well, what could we do to fix it? We replaced the impacted NAT instances, right? Everything should be fine now. We're new source IPs, and so the traffic is okay. But we forgot that we actually accessed some critical services over the internet. At that time, we were running a Cloud SQL database. And it wasn't available over private VPC yet at that point. And so all the apps connecting to Cloud SQL at this critical database had their connection severed and stopped working. So after a couple of hours of digging around where we managed these static IPs and reconfiguring the firewall rules, everything came back and everything was back to normal. But we had quite a bit of follow-up to do after this one. And the first one was creating an, image web, uh, an admission webhook that disallowed some of these floating tags that we use on images. Latest is the one that's sort of most commonly used, so we started there. And we attached this admission webhook to a number of different resources. Deployments, stateful sets, statement sets, jobs, and pods. Pretty standard, right? The problem is that the control loop that's creating pods is generally something that's running in the cluster, right? So we're not surfacing this feedback to users. There's no users involved when we're creating new pods. So existing deployments or other workloads are creating new pods as a result of nodes dying and it being rescheduled or scale ups or anything like that. And these pods are actually being rejected by the webhook, so we're unable to schedule anything new in the cluster. So we adjusted our webhook to not apply to pod objects, just apply to workload objects, and several days later, a week later, we're finally back to normal after our image registry issues. When users um, pinged us one morning with an issue which was, I can't access API server and I can't use kubectl, we were like, well, this is probably a very simple issue, probably just a misconfiguration. But then someone else just pinged us again. So I tried, and I couldn't connect either. So things were, trying to, were starting to look pretty bad. So the first thing we did is look at the API server. And as you can see on this graph, the load of the API server is huge. I mean, it's amounting to about, um, about 60. And to give you an idea, this node has uh, eight calls, so it's, it's pretty bad. And looking deeper into what was happening on the node, we saw that the memory was going down and that API server was, were actually getting um killed, which, as you can imagine, is not a very good situation to be in. Another interesting uh, metric was that suddenly uh, outgoing traffic was much higher than before on the API server and at the at point we had no idea why. So we tried to understand what we had changed, and it turned out we had just made a small change to kube2iam. So I don't know if you know kube2iam, but it's basically a daemon set you run that allows every pod to have, a different, to have different permissions on AWS. So we run them on every node on AWS, and we had made a small change on kube2iam to improve security and started the deployment, and the deployment was lining exactly with, with the issue. So we looked at, at kube2iam, and as you can see on this graph, kube2iam pods were restarting very heavily, which wasn't expected at all. So the reason these pods were restarted was because they were getting um killed. So we started increasing the memory limit on the, on the pods. And a typical usage would be a few megabytes. But after this change, uh, pods were now consuming 300 megabytes, which was pretty surprising to us. The reason for the issue was we had made a patch to improve security in kube 2 iam And we had made a small typo on the selector used by kube 2 iam So kube 2 iam needs to synchronize all the pods running on the node where kube 2 iam is running to get the annotation of all the pods it's collocated with to know which role to assume. So you have an annotation you had. And so it needed to know for all the pods running on the node which annotation they have. And by mistake, we had removed the selector. So instead of syncing maybe 5, 10, 20 pods locally on each kube2iam, we were now syncing the global cluster, which was a very huge one. And of course, I mean, kube2iam was, by consequence, consuming a lot more memory and was being killed. And of course, I mean, requesting information about all the pods in the cluster on each pod in a daemon set is pretty bad on the API server, and this is why everything broke. We should have um, seen that before, but we tested on much smaller cluster, and in much smaller cluster, it wasn't an issue at all. So only when we deployed to staging with a large scale cluster, that everything started to break. Well, this is another user reported one. And uh, so we're, we're getting a report that no nodes are 
uh, no new nodes are scheduling application pods. So this is weird, right? We, so we've, we're kind of not strangers to scheduling issues. And so we take a look. And we see a really sharp increase in the number of events coming from Kubernetes at this time. And there's two types of events that we're sort of concerned with, right? The first one is failed scheduling. Not a surprise. We know it's a scheduling issue already. And the, and the second one is not trigger scale up. So this is from another component in the cluster, the cluster autoscaler. And it's sort of indicating that none of the node types that we have running in our cluster could satisfy what our applications are requesting. We know that nodes are already running applications, and so there should be nodes available. We don't have any new deployments that are changing resource requests, so it's a little bit confusing. So quick aside in sort of how we handle scheduling here, we have a custom resource type that we call a node group, and we make a lot of assumptions on our applications that they're single tenants on a node. And so we use taints and tolerations as well as resource requests to sort of take an application and tie it to a particular node type based on what we expect the resources to be available. That includes what we're using for system components and daemon sets as well. Well, we messed up a little bit. And we added a new daemon set, and we added resource requests to it. So all of these nodes that should have been able to schedule our applications on them based on their existing resource requests could no longer fit the applications on there because of this additional daemon set. Even worse, the daemon set actually had a pod priority of critical. And so we got really lucky that we did this in a 1.10 cluster. Uh, had this been on a newer cluster, this daemon set would have actually evicted all of our workloads off of our hosts, and we would have taken all of Datadog down. This one was pretty interesting. What, what happened is one day, the Logs team reached out and told us the number of the volume of log you're actually sending now is much bigger than it used to be. And it's actually the indexing of your logs is getting slower. And we wonder if it's legitimate. So we hadn't changed anything. So we're pretty sure we, it wasn't a big deal. But still, we looked at the volumes of log we were actually sending. So this is the volume of log Per, per source um, in, in, in our case. And as you can see, like typical normal behavior would be to send about 1 million log per minute on, uh, on, this, on this particular infra. And suddenly, it had over a few hours going from 1 million to about 15 million a minute. This is like quite a lot. So what had happened, actually, is for security reason, we had enabled audit on the machine. So we had deployed a daemon set that was using go audit, enabling, uh, enabling audit. And what happens when you run Kubernetes is the nodes where you run the kubelet and the containers are actually very heavy users of audit logs because they do a lot of syscalls, a lot of execs, and a lot of appetable commands. And all of these are logged. And this is actually the reason for this increase of logs. So how we fixed that? Well, we told the logs in that we didn't need that traffic. So they dropped all the traffic at intake. And on our side, we removed the, the daemon set. And things seem to go back to normal. Where did all my pods go? So we have a, an application that enabled autoscaling for their, uh, for, their, for their application. And all of their pods disappeared. So typically, when we have a deployment, we're explicitly setting the number of replicas. In this case, we have 60 for this application. And we want to enable autoscaling using a horizontal pod autoscaler. This is basically a description of an autoscaling policy. In this case, it's a really simple one, looking at the CPU usage for the pod, scaling it up and down based on what our target is specified as. In this case, what happens is a controller that's in charge of horizontal pod autoscalers is managing the replica count of the deployment uh, as it reads through the, the metric values. And so we don't want to be setting that value explicitly anymore. Right? We want to remove it from our spec, and we want to allow this to be something, a dynamic runtime decision. Well, there's a little trick to this. What happens when you have uh, this value specified uh, in, a, in a manifest that's uh, applied by cube control is that cube control adds uh, an annotation on it of what the manifest looked like when it was applied. And so we can see all the fields there. When we submit the new manifest to the API, it compares what it was last and what it is now. And it sees when it's removed, it actually defaults it to one. So we scaled down 59 replicas of the application. There's uh, not a great workaround for this one. Unfortunately, you need to sort of modify this annotation at the same time as you're submitting your manifest. But we're not, we're not managing this annotation as part of our manifest. And so we need to go in and use kube control edit to change the replica count, to remove it, and remove the last applied annotation so that we can not scale down all of our applications. A little bit tricky.
you know how it is. Sometimes computers seem to do things on their own, and it feels like there's a ghost doing things. And this is how this morning started. So the data store team reached out and told us, well, we deployed 120 node customers were closed yesterday, and everything went up fine, and everything was working perfectly. But when we got back this morning, this cluster was completely broken, and nobody had done anything. So yeah, we were suspecting a ghost. But we looked into details, and it turned out 25% of the pods were actually pending now, and they had volume affinity issues, which was pretty weird. We went deeper, and it turned out like 25% of the node had been deleted. And since we use local volumes for Cassandra clusters, these pods were bound to local volumes that were associated to nodes that were gone. And so they were pending because they were not schedulable because they couldn't find their persistent volumes. So I know, I mean, we're supposed to be cloud native and be resilient to node failure, but 25% of the node is kind of a big deal. So we were pretty sure the cloud provider hadn't deleted 25 nodes, 25% uh, of the node that night. What had happened is we, were we had deployed the Cassandra cluster on a node scaling group, a single one over three AZs. But when we did the deployment, there, was, there were capacity issues on one of the AZs, and only 20 nodes were available. So what AWS had done is create more nodes in, in another AZ where there was no capacity issues, which was fine, and this is the left part of the graph. But during the night, capacity became available on the second zone. So the auto-scaling group is actually pretty clever. And what it does, it tries to rebalance so you have an even number of nodes in, in all the AZ, and so 40, 40 per node. And so it started deleting our instance very actively. And of course, everything exploded. So this was like a um, pretty surprising one. And so the way we fix it is now we have a different auto-scaling group in, in each zone, which is a lot safer. The worst situation is, well, if we lack capacity in a zone, at least we know that all the nodes are not going to come up, and so we won't be able to create the cluster. But we can just wait for it. Getting this kind of surprise is a bad one. So we had a report of a slow deploy heartbeat, and probably nobody knows what that is, so let me explain. We run a sort of end-to-end -end test for our deployments. So this is everything from source control through some templating steps through our deploy tooling and to a pod running in Kubernetes. And this helps us get a sort of end-to-end -end test of, of latency of how all these systems are, are, are behaving. And so this is sort of what it looked like over the course of a month in one of our larger clusters. And you can see it's getting progressively worse. But uh, we're growing the cluster at this time. We're aggressively deploying workloads onto it. So we're really not sure if this is just scheduling latency, if, something's, if we're, we're reaching some bottlenecks of one of the control plane components, or what's going on. Well, we dig a little bit deeper, and we find another metric that correlates really well with this. And this is the number of pods that the, etcd, uh, that the API server is, uh, has seen and is stored in etcd. And so what are we looking at here? Well, we had 4,000 pending pods in our cluster uh, that were unschedulable. Well, it turns out that we had a cron job set to create a pod, to create a job every 10 minutes, and it had the wrong toleration applied. And so there were no nodes in the cluster that could satisfy the toleration on this pod. So we've got 4,000 of these pending, and every single loop of the scheduler is considering all 4,000 of these pods and trying to place it onto nodes in the cluster. So this is impacting the performance of the scheduler, the cluster autoscaler, and several other components in the control plane. I mean, we, we use containers, and well, we expect them to be contained. And well, we're going to see that it's not always the case. So the, f the first topic in this one is broken runtime. Uh, we use ContainerD as a runtime, and we've broken it in, in many ways. And we're going to give you a few examples. So the first one was a team reached out because they couldn't delete a, a pod in, in on, a, on a node. And when they deleted it, it, was, it, was, it kept being in a terminating state and was never going anyway. So I connected to the instance and, try, and was trying to do things. Uh, so I was unable to do anything. Uh, ContainerD was complaining quite a lot. So I looked at the process tree. And as you can see there in the process tree, we see a lot of zombies. And this screenshot there is only a very small part of the list, because you can see there on the PS command that we had 16,000 zombies on the machine. As you can imagine, the kernel was not very happy about that. So how did that happen? 
This application was a Redis slave and master. And that readiness probe that was doing the command here, so it's a small shell script, but basically the gist of it is this shell script was doing a Redis ping on master and slave nodes. It turns out Redis pings are a lot faster on master nodes than slave nodes, so master node was very fine, were completely fine. However, sometimes it took a few seconds for ping to work on slave, on slave pods. And since the timeout was set to one second, the exec command was killed, and since there was nothing to rip the children, so the defunct process in the, in the image, in the process tree, all these were remaining as zombies. So as you can imagine, if you run this readiness probe every minute, you can get quite a few zombies very fast. So the main takeaway on this one is be very careful with exec base probe, and please use something like Tini as, a, uh, in it, uh, as PID1 in your containers. I think this was, this is probably my favorite issue. It's also starting very similarly to the one before. Sometime reached out telling, telling me like, I can't delete a pod on a node. So I connected to a node, uh, looked at the process, and I was like, okay, I'm just going to kill this process. So I tried to kill it, didn't work. I tried to sick kill it, didn't work. So I was starting wondering how, I mean, how could I be in a situation when I couldn't kill a process? So I look at what the process was doing, and as you can see, this process was stuck in a function called refrigerator. So I knew my morning was going to be interesting. <laughs> what had happened this time is these instances were running Kafka workloads, and we had an issue with the NVMe driver. And one of the I.O. from Kafka was hanging because the NVMe driver had an issue. Since the I.O. was blocking, there was no way to kill the process. So this is when I couldn't seek kill it. However, what happens when, when you delete a container, the first thing that the runtime is going to do is going to try and freeze the C group, so all the process in the C group of the container, to make sure that these processes are not going to do anything when they're deleted. So the kernel was trying to freeze the C group, but it couldn't because one of the processes in the C group was stuck on an I.O. And that's, uh, this refrigerator function is actually the function called by freezing the C group. So yeah, this is uh, interesting because the underlying issue is a very low level uh, disk issue. The first two examples I gave you were examples of things going uh, bad that are actually all hopefully kind of rare. But one of the issues we see the most uh, in terms of our things contain are performance issues. And I'm sure a lot of you <coughs> have had some of those. So a very simple symptom. Um, our, uh, our deployment is slow. It's getting very slow, and we have no clue why. So when we start, when we investigate this, we start to look at the node where the pod has been scheduled. And we noticed that after accepting the pod locally, the kubelet took like almost a minute to start a container, which is much higher than what you would expect. So we looked at um, how the node pool, so the group of nodes where this pod was supposed to be scheduled, we look at the load of all the nodes. And well, as you can see on this graph, the load was pretty high. So these are pretty small machines. And the load is about, um, I can't remember, but about 50 or something. So of course, with this kind of load, the kubelet and container D and everything was having a hard time. So the next step was to investigate why the load was high. It turned out it's because the instance was writing a lot of I.O. So as you can see on the graph on the, uh, at the bottom, so the left part is before we fix it and the right part after, we had a lot of sustained I.O. on all these nodes, especially one. And as you can see in the graph is the middle, well, the reason why everything was getting so slow and the load so high is because we use EBS for root disk, and it's a small disk, about uh, 30 gigabytes most of the time. And on this specific node, so the, blue, the light blue one, as you can see on the left, there was no burst balance. So this means we were rate limited by the EBS at the lowest level, and we were not able to actually go above the limit. And usually this indicates that you're consuming more IOs uh, in a sustained fashion that the EBS can provide. And as you can see, when we fixed it, things went a lot better. So why did we have so many, so many IOs on this machine? So we were looking at everything, and well, the biggest workload running on this node was called DNS. Uh, 
So we look at what was happening on the, in the core DNS metrics, and we saw that the number of queries had more than double over the last few hours. And the thing is, it's very difficult to diagnose DNS and to see what is happening. So the way we do it is we actually log all the queries, and we do um, sampling uh, at the log when we when you get the logs. However, we do sampling very late in the chain, which means all the logs are actually written to disk before, and of course it's generating I/O. So we were lucky because since we had logs, we were able to actually identify the team. I mean the application that had started to do that. So we went to the team and well told them, well, you have a new application that you just deploy, and it's doing 50,000 DNS queries per second. That seems like quite a lot for one pod. And well, we're lucky because we we had we had, had so many issues with DNS at that point that we have an offer as infra, which is you can have a core DNS local cache locally on your nodes, and just a matter of adding an annotation in your pod, and we have an admission controller that's going to rewrite the DNS configuration and connect you to the local cache. So we did that, as as you can see on the graph, things immediately went a lot better. So you can see on this graph there that, well, you see the blue line, it's getting a lot better very fast. However, the load, um, the, the amount of IOs is still pretty high on this group of nodes that is not doing much. And since I was investigating it, I, was, I kept looking at it. You remember audit before? So we had, I mean, we had like kind of a bad problem with audit, and we, had, we thought we had fixed it. But what we had done is we had removed the demon set, we had dropped uh, traffic at intake on the log intake, so we didn't get all this traffic, so things seemed fine. However, audit had been enabled in the kernel. So all the audit, there was no audit daemon running, but audit was still enabled in the kernel, which means the kernel was loading all the audit messages, and journal D was logging all the audit messages too. So they were still returned to disk, which was pretty bad. So we disabled audit on all the machines. And as you can see on the graph, it went a lot better almost, almost, almost immediately. At that point, I had spent a few hours on these machines, and I was still not very happy. Because if you can see this graph, there's probably 10 to 15 nodes in the group, and they're all behaving the same with like a low number of IOPS. And one of them was very different, which was still confusing. I wanted to understand why. I zoomed on the graph before, and it's, it's not actually sustained. When you look at it, like when you zoom, you can see that it's not like IO all the time. It's spike of IO every minute. I started to wonder, is there something we do every minute on this, on this group of nodes? And it turned out um, we had a cron job running every minute. And so you would expect, when you have 10 nodes with the right taints, um, that a cron job is going to run on all the nodes in the group. It turned out the scheduler is actually very predictable. It's going to run the same algorithm every time it needs to schedule the pod from the cron job. And it's very likely that it's going to make the same decision, because either there are more requests available on the node, or even the image is already present, so it's going to be faster, and this node is going to be preferred. And as you can see on the, back, on the graph at the bottom, it turned out that these jobs were always scheduled on the same node, or almost always. And as you can see in the number of containers created on each node over time. <coughs> so yeah, the issue was this cron job. I mean, we, we had seen that disabling it fixed it, changing the script fixed it to just sleep instead of doing what it was doing. And this job was actually a very simple one. It was just supposed to synchronize the IP address of our console servers not in Kubernetes cluster as endpoint for a Kubernetes service, so any application in the cluster could reach the console server outside of Kubernetes. It's basically these two commands. So describe AWS instances and get the IP of the console servers and update the kubectl endpoint. I mean, as you can see there, it's pretty difficult to imagine that this is generating a lot of IOs. I was getting pretty mad. I mean, re replacing this by sleep would generate zero IO. <coughs> So it turns out, when you run kubectl on a brand new pod, kubectl is doing a lot of things. It's caching all the API description locally, and it's creating 160 files, and doing 45 uh, HTTP queries to get all, the, all this information. And of course, this explains the spike in IOs, because every minute, kubectl would run, synchronize all the APIs, 
create all this file. And yeah, this is how we got all these IOs. Well, our final way to shoot yourself in the foot. Graceful termination. So we've got this uh, kind of slick setup with one of our applications. It's, uh, it's a queue consumer, and so we're auto-scaling it based on queue depth. We've got a custom metric reporting in, and we're able to sort of dynamically scale up this application based on the, num the number of payloads that are in the queue. And it's a really great experience for our users. There's one caveat to this, and that uh, when we scale down, we need to make sure that these jobs are completing the work that they're doing. And for this application, that can actually take hours, up to 48 hours for this one. So let's look at what happens when we scale down the application. Right? First, the pod enters terminating state. And since it's got the grace period set to 48 hours, it's not going to be terminated right away, but it enters terminating state. First thing that happens is that cube to IAM refuses to refresh the credentials because it's now in terminating state. Well, we're able to solve that one. Next thing that happens is that inevitably the kubelet restarts. The reason for that is because we restart the kubelet every 24 hours to rotate uh, certificates. And so inevitably, if we're waiting 48 hours for this, it's the application is going to get sig killed when the kubelet's communication with container D is severed. Well, we're also able to get that one fixed in container D. And so it's problem solved. As a few takeaways on this presentation, be very careful with daemon sets when you start to run large clusters, because I think we've broken all the things that daemon sets depend upon. We've broken DNS, Vault, uh, repository. Be very careful when we're managing things by the thousand. Um, it's very easy to, to break things. DNS is hard. This is not a new one. Um, I know the community is working very hard on making it easier, but it's still kind of a sort of many problems. Another important one is we tend to forget that below, below the kubelet, there's actually underlying infra. And so having issue with IOs or auto-scaling group is something that's going to happen. And the last one is one of the trickiest to, to manage. And this is the reason why we're actually using pools per application team. So there's no noisy neighbor problem, because containers are not really contained yet. We're able to isolate memory and CPU, but IOs, network, uh, number of processes, all that kind of thing are not really contained. And so you can very easily break another application by running uh, something that's not, not great. And that's all. Thanks a lot for coming. <laughs> <laughs>